Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness. Adapted from the novelization by J.R. Millward. Based on an original story by A. Murty Schofield. With J.R. Millward and Adam Coover. With music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Episode 12. Beyond the security door, I followed the train lines to a cross junction thronged with shadows. A turntable set into the floor presumably allowed heavy goods to be directed into one of three fenced-off areas. I kept my gun in hand and padded cautiously along the wall, sticking to the gloom behind wooden crates and oil drums. With no windows and only a few flickering sodium lights, the interior of the warehouse felt doubly threatening. Steam hissed from heating ducts, and condensation drip dripped into noisome puddles. There didn't seem to be anyone around. Two of the three junction offshoots were inaccessible, guarded by electrified fences that buzzed like nests of angry hornets. With a twist of frustration, I realized that my security guard matched the sign on a door immediately beyond one of the fences. Even assuming I could manage to slide my hand through without getting fried, there was no way my whole body would be able to do the same. I had to turn off the power first, and that meant more exploring. In a mad spirit of cooperation, the last junction happened to be protected by a bog-standard chain-link fence and a couple of hefty rottweilers on the other side. The dogs watched me balefully and growled as they detected my unfamiliar scent. Fortunately, my unexpected disarmament, whilst in the Louvre, had not robbed me of Wren's tranquilizer gun. Don't look at me like that. I like dogs. Brainwashed humans toting heavy artillery are another matter entirely. Apart from a surprised whimper, neither of the dogs made a sound as the darts did their work. In less than a minute, they were both dozing with all the limp grace of pillowcases stuffed with warm jelly. The mass to weight ratio could only be guessed, but I was pretty confident that it would be at least an hour before they woke up. After vaulting the fence, I dusted off my hands and surveyed the workshop that would have done credit to an aircraft hangar. At the centre stood a low platform, at least 30 feet long and 20 wide, upon which rested a carved limestone tablet of equally gigantic proportions. Two saw-toothed cutting wheels on swing arms stood poised above it, as menacing in their barbarity as surgeons back in the days when brandy and bone sores were still considered medical chic. To an archaeologist, it was akin to seeing a puppy tied up under a bacon slicer. I know I've inflicted my share of collateral damage during my career, but this was deliberate, methodical butchery of cultural artefacts with no regard for their preservation. What? I'm allowed to have my sentimental moments. Two more tablets leaned against the walls, easily weighing several tons apiece, yet still managing to look small in the huge workshop. The designs were badly eroded, but I could still make out a lamassu type figure, a bull-bodied man with the braided hair and beard common to Mesopotamian regions throughout the Bronze Age. The nearby crates were all stamped with Anatolia, Turkey. However, I didn't recognize any of the scripts chiseled below him. It certainly wasn't Arabic or Hebrew. Perhaps they came with one of the convoys Luddick was talking about. 
Hmm. Verna mentions the Periot shards having been looted from underground cities in ancient Turkey. So perhaps these tablets were brought from the same region. I'm sure I've heard of the place. Damn, it's been a while since I studied it. The knowledge was within me. A reference that linked back to one of the many theological debates I'd shared with Father Patrick. Where had I seen the name written down recently? An angelic statuette. Gleaming in the low light of Vasily's secret office and the handwritten card resting at its feet. <sighs> Cappadocia, of course. It's one of the richest archeological sites in all Turkey and it's slap bang in the middle of Anatolia. Father Patrick mentioned it when Schmidt started excavating Gobekli Tepe further to the south in the 90s. If there was anywhere I'd be willing to bet connected to the Nephilim myth, Cappadocia would be top of my list. If that's true, then maybe Bouchard was right. And Eckhart really has managed to salvage the Cubicula Nephili. It might even be here, right now, in the Strahov. <sighs> One more thing for me to clean up. Come on, Lara, back to business. If we built this place, where would we house the power systems? Oh, that's easy. Somewhere out of the reach of interfering intruders like us. In other words, behind one of those electrified fences we just passed. Say, doesn't that vent go straight through the wall? Thirty crowded seconds later, I emerged from behind a control panel. Coughing and brushing dust off my shoulders. The panel fizzled and sparked, sending out wafts of smoke, whilst one of the big blades gleamed from its resting place buried several feet into the wall behind me. There are times when I think the gods just want me to have fun. Whether it's driving a quad bike at full speed over an electrified fence to Gatecrush Area 51, informing Pierre Dupont that I'm a busy girl, or fantasizing about using a wise-cracking American hacker for target practice over certain comments about my bony ass. I do occasionally have the chance to enjoy myself. There was a tortured whine as the ventilation shaft swung down and crunched into the floor. The severed edges still glowed dull orange. Perhaps we should install some of these blades in the gym. Excellent for practicing your dodging. And for Winston to carve Sunday roasts. <clears throat> Maggie, much as I appreciate the optimism that we will use the gym again, could use some quiet now, please. My head fell silent, and silence closed in around me like the narrowing vent walls as I inched my way onwards. The temperature dropped. In the dark, I crawled on, trying to limit any bumping or scuffling noises that might give me away. In fact, I was surprised that no one had come running when the blades had been chewing through the vent. Perhaps the Strahov was just used to wholesale, ear-splitting destruction. The air became cloying, like meat that had spoiled and gone rancid. I would have swooned but for the gentle thrum of power still guarding me. The sound was coming from below me, but was almost imperceptible against the whisper of my breathing. Dusty fingers of light shone up through a narrow grating. 
found him skulking around the loading bay. Must have got a passcode. You can't keep me here. My paper will miss me if I don't report in. Oh no. In a heartbeat, my eye was pressed against the floor. The room below me was tiny, little more than a prison cell, and shared the same stark decor. Cowering on a chair, his hat missing and glasses askew, was Ludic. The man he was addressing stepped into the light, unhurried and with his face empty of expression. Instinctively, I felt my skin try to shrivel up and crawl away from his presence. Close the door on your way out, Gunderson. Oh, crap. Humans are pack animals. It's nothing to be ashamed about. The herding instinct is simply built into us. When we see another human being in mortal danger, we will typically do one of two things. Panic and bolt, or rally round to defend the one most in jeopardy. Even the most stubborn humans will react fairly predictably when faced with a situation that triggers this innate behaviour. My hand was already going for my gun before Eckhart had finished his sentence. And just as quickly, I remembered why humans also needed reason to survive. The line of sight was peerless. I could have squeezed off half a dozen rounds into Eckhart's skull before he'd even had the chance to turn round. Ludic would have escaped the monstrum, only to be mown down by armed guards as he fled the room. A diversion might work for five or six seconds, but I knew Eckhart would not trouble himself to find and kill me personally. That's what his guard dog Gunderson was for. There was nothing I could do. Ludic was already dead. There have been many occasions when I faced death, but never when it was someone else's head on the block, and never when I was powerless to stop it. Ludic, the poor, blundering idiot, was only here because of me. The knowledge grabbed my heart and squeezed with wrenching clarity. I felt my eyes burn and chest constrict, the pain as futile as it was inescapable. Nevertheless, I couldn't turn away. I owed him that much. Eckhart wasn't even looking at him. His right hand, practically mummified within its bizarre wrappings, traced gently across the far wall, like a child dreamily drawing pictures in sand. Then he advanced, batting the light bulb aside. Shadows danced and swung, and his own abruptly swelled in girth like demonic wings. I have record on you, Eckhart. You, you, you can't hurt me. If only there was time for us to read them together. But it is too late now. There are things to be done. To my dying day, I'll never forget Ludic's screams. I flung a hand across my eyes, shielding them from the searing arcs that suddenly exploded in the room below. It was as though an electrical substation was overloading, sending out sparks and deadly lightnings in all directions as they frantically sought to ground themselves. The discharge made my hair stand on end. An old metal filling began to vibrate setting my jawbone to a furious aching. Smoke began drifting up through the grating, carrying the stink of burning flesh and hair. Throughout it all, Ludic was crying out. Incoherent, indecent sounds, unrecognisable as human. 
It lasted 14 seconds. It was 14 seconds too long. I realized I was breathing hard, whilst trying not to breathe at all. With a succession of sound, I looked down, just in time to see Eckhart roll his neck, clicking each vertebra in turn, before turning on his heel and leaving the room. His expression was unfocused, preoccupied, as though he were leaving a satisfying but not exceptional restaurant. All that remained of Luddick was a smoking, twisted mess of black charred gore. The bones popping as fires slowly consumed the remains and the plastic chair beneath. My gorge rose violently. Fury raked cold claws through my stomach. But I wasn't reckless enough to give in to it. Instead of releasing the tide of emotion, I squeezed my eyes shut and channeled the energy into my breathing. It took a few moments, but slowly I regained some measure of composure. The anger hadn't gone away. I'd merely redirected it into long-term storage. It was a far cry from the meditative ballet of violence or the hunter's mantra that held fear at bay. But if I didn't keep my anger under control now, I wouldn't be able to make use of it properly when the time came. If I had any say in the matter, that time was going to come very, very soon. The power. Get the power switched off. My subconscious's gentle reminder was like a nudge to my physical body. I leaned on her briefly for support, letting my emotions stabilise until I felt I could trust myself to get to the end of the vent without making any noise. The vent terminated in a slatted grill that wasn't even screwed on. I swung it up cautiously, thankful that the hinges were well oiled. A lone guard stood directly below me, invisible until I peered over the edge. There was no one else about. Eckhart had evidently left to attend some evil scheme or other, a habit shared by most supernatural villains. The boiling hatred was quashed almost as soon as it rose within me, a sign of my hopefully increasing self-control. I weighed up my options, and Simple won the vote. The guard never knew what hit him. Or maybe I'm not being generous. He briefly knew what hit him i.e. a heavily armed woman dropped onto his shoulders, tightened her thighs around his neck, and his spinal cord snapped like a child's glow stick. I leapt clear of his body and took cover beside a jumbo-sized wooden reel of industrial cable before anyone else in the vicinity could protest my arrival. I peered around the hallway, a continuation of the junction that was walled off by the high-voltage fencing. Gas canisters, HGV tyres, and other warehouse paraphernalia littered the area, although I doubted that miniature anti-personnel mines with blinking motion detectors were standard issue in Prague's industrial quarter. Several of the devices were placed along the hallway. Coupled with the electrified fences, SMG-armed guards and dogs, it added a certain obsessive-compulsive flavour to the Strahov security. Wonderful. The approach of voices made me draw further into the shadows. The men evidently spotted the guard's broken body because they suddenly began shouting. They might as well have painted bullseyes on their foreheads. My faithful little scorpion barked twice and both men went down with neat holes just above their eyes, their deaths too swift to cry out a warning. The ricochet that struck one of the nearby gas canisters, however, more than made up for that. I 
Had I been standing any closer, the concussion would have probably blown me to pieces. As it was, the blast swatted me aside like a tornado wielding a king-sized mattress, depositing me in a bruised heap twelve feet away. Vague shapes began coalescing out of the murk. Floor? Walls. Ceiling. Something warm and sticky trickled from my right nostril and slid down my cheek as I lay on my side. For a confused second, I wondered why the wooden cable drum was getting smaller. I blinked and realised it was rolling away from me. The explosion must have nudged it out of position. The return of coherent thinking was like an electrical jolt. My body responded on autopilot. I scrambled for cover and winced as I dabbed at the blood dripping down my nose. Every breath felt like a sadist raking a cheese grater against my lungs. I'd had fractured ribs before. I knew there was bugger all I could do except rest and take plenty of painkillers. Angry shouting suggested that such a luxury would have to wait. I cursed under my breath, biting my lip to keep the pain at bay, and cocked my gun. The blast had thrown me across the hallway to a blocky, white-walled structure like a prefab construction office. I peered around the stack of crates and spotted a lone guard negotiating the metal steps. The scope of his gun swung in wide arcs as he growled an irritated reply to his companion in the doorway. I didn't need to speak Czech to know he was both puzzled and pissed off by the explosion. My mental exercises to block out pain aren't just for show, you know. I rose, firing from the hip, and struck him in the neck just as his own shots went wide. Gritting my teeth, I vaulted up the flight of steps and unloaded more rounds at the pair of guards surging from the tiny cafeteria. They came at me like Kevlar-clad grizzly bears, shoving tables and chairs out of the way as their sidearms unloaded military-grade rounds in my general direction. Note general. Note shoving tables and chairs. Despite their training, I'd taken the men by surprise. And knocking over furniture in a slippery tiled cafe is a recipe for foot-tangling disaster. Both men stumbled, their shots missing me by yards. The smell of fireworks joined the warehouse's unique chemical aroma. And my ears rang with the thunder of gunshots in close quarters. From my crouched position by the door, I was able to pick them off quickly, without wasting ammo or time. A concussive boom rattled the teeth in my jaw, and I turned towards the source, back the way I had come. A second blast, smaller than the first, echoed down the hallway, and this time I could see what was happening. The cable drum, in its unthinking benevolence, was rolling down the hall and setting off the motion-sensitive mines as it went. Even as I watched, the third and final mine exploded and the battle-scarred drum trundled to a drunken halt. My escape route had just become a lot more straightforward. But I still had to turn off the power. Ignoring my body's protests, I stepped over the corpses and scrutinised the security station. I recognised several areas of the warehouse on the CCTV screens, and there was a status map of the entire complex etched in glowing green lines. I'd known the Strahov had to be big, but I hadn't realised just how damned big until I took a closer look at the map. <laughs> Spots of blood appeared on the screen from my bleeding nose. The warehouse is just the surface structure. 
Look at it all. The rooms go deep underground. Much deeper. And... Hello. What's this? I zoomed in on a peculiar feature. Some eight or nine stories below my present location. I couldn't be sure, but it looked like some kind of pressure chamber. The kind you see divers or caisson workers using to recover from the bends. It was suspended by taut steel cables over an enormous iron-clad pit. Biohazard and radiation symbols flash their sinister warnings alongside the map's schematics. I wonder what needs that kind of security. The map awoke a sense of deja vu. Sure enough, when I checked the fifth obscura engraving against the glowing blueprint, the two were a near-perfect match. It took a few minutes, but eventually I felt confident enough to fold up the engraving and return it to Werner's notebook. <sighs> well, it looks like my route to the vault will take me through that biodome. It's a long way round, though. Unless you shut the power off to that section as well. We still need to get through that electrified fencing. And who's to say we won't meet more locked doors between here and the vault? Why not kill the entire grid? But what about that... whatever it is... in that high security section? What about it? What if we set loose something that ought not to be set loose? Unless you've forgotten, Maggie, I've been there, done that, and do not fancy repeating the same mistake. <sighs> Lara, this isn't Egypt. If Eckhart is stupid enough to keep a... a ravening monster locked up in a secret underground vault, then more fool him if it escapes. Besides, it might give us a useful diversion, if there's anything locked in there at all. Well, when you put it like that. There was no password or login needed. The guards hadn't had the chance to lock me out. One by one, sections marked in green switched to ominous red. Reminding me not a little of that scene in Jurassic Park when Dr. Sadler rebooted the park's systems. I could only hope that my quest would not suffer the same fate as Mr. Spielberg's little adventure. All at once, I felt my battered body demanding attention. The pain in my ribs blossomed like an obscene flower, leaving me gripping the console for support. Steady, girl. There's no one around to see you lose control. Come on, there are some analgesics in your backpack. I know, I know. Oh, and while you're at it, there's a vending machine around the corner. Get something to eat before you fall over. It would have been pointless to argue. A few minutes later, I licked the last crumbs of chocolate from my mouth and finished the last of my fizzy energy drink. Sterile wipes stemmed the bleeding from the burst capillaries in my nose, and the handful of pills from my medikit gradually began to take effect. My ribs still might be bruised out of recognition, but at least they wouldn't distract me from what I had come for. Thanks to the cable drum, my route back to the warehouse junction was uneventful. The main lights were all out, but some kind of emergency generator kicked in just as I was loping along the hallway. The emergency lighting was dim, and for a panicked moment, I feared the security systems had also been reactivated. The warning signs were still there on the fencing, still threatening me with 10,000 volts of hair-curling death. But the telltale hum was absent, and the metal was cold and lifeless. I tested it with the simple expedient of kicking it open. The vault of trophies and the sand glyph awaited me. A grim smile touched my lips. 
if Eckhart didn't yet know his fortress was under siege, he wasn't going to remain ignorant for long. In episode 12 of Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, Lara Croft was played by J.R. Millward. Thomas Luddick, Martin Gunderson, and Peter Van Eckhart were played by Adam Coover. Written and adapted by J.R. Millward. Based on an original story by A. Murty Schofield with music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Additional sound effects courtesy of www.freesfx.co.uk, the BBC and the YouTube Audio Library. Produced by Stephen Millward. Lara Croft and Tomb Raider are the property of Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix.